Halo. Hello everyone. Lovely to see some familiar faces. Hello Asma, how are you? Getting ready for tomorrow? <laughs> There you go. Hello, Alina. Thank you so much for joining, darling. Hi, Araceli. Thanks for having me. Always your insights are amazing. Marian, Rania, Kimberly, welcome. Asia, my sister, things around here. Manisha, hello. Salma, Angelica, Habiba, of course. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Fashion Revolution. <laughs> <You're ready. laughs> <laughs> How's everybody? We're going to wait a little bit before we start, but just in case you know that the drill always, uh, the sessions we record and we stream them to Facebook and then we record them and later we'll do things on, the, on uh, YouTube. So please, if it's an issue for you, make sure you have your black uh, screen and you don't show your video, okay, my dears? Oh my God, we have Fashion Revolution Egypt in the house. Hello, Rania. <laughs> That's so great. That's so, so great. All right, so we have Vanda joining. Fantastic. I'm gonna wait one or two more minutes before we start. We have an amazing panel today. I think you guys are gonna love it. Today is one of the nerdy panels, let's say. <laughs> because we're gonna dissect the difference between cultural appreciation and cultural appropriation. And we have seen a lot of this lately in the media. So I think it's very interesting to learn you know, what is it, what is not, why is it an issue, why it may not be an issue, so that we actually can then and understand better why is why is happening. Okay, we have more people joining. Hello, Belinda, how are you? Welcome on board. All right. Thanks everyone for joining and for, uh, for writing your gorgeous messages on the chat. It's really fantastic to see you all there. So, 5.35, I think we should start. Oh, we have more people joining, okay. Bhavna, and Bhavna is very interesting to have on board. Um, we're gonna greet her. Hello, Babna. How are you? Hi, I'm good. Thank you. Babna is part of a slow fashion movement. So she's also based here in Dubai and she is a fantastic, fantastic person to know. She knows a whole lot about fashion and a lot about sustainability. So it's fantastic to have you on board, my darling. And I think we're going to wait. We're going to start because we already have uh, 20 people in the room. Don't want uh, the ones that were on time to, you know, to feel disrespected. So first of all, thank you so much for everybody to join today's session. Uh, we're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to learn new things about what is cultural appreciation, what is cultural appropriation, why it's important that we know about it, and what can we do about it. Um, they probably may be a lot of designers in the house, and I think this goes precisely for you guys. So let's see. Um, well, I, I think this year, you already know by now, if you have been attending the other panels, we took a democratic vote in Fashion Revolution UAE, and we decide what manifesto points we wanted to talk about and to learn about for this Fashion Revolution. And the manifesto points that came out were number four, number five, and number seven. And today we're actually learning about number five. And number five says, fashion respects culture and heritage, fostering the skills and craftsmanship, and never appropriates without giving due credit or permission. But this is happening, and this has been happening for a while. 
And we're going to try to learn and understand why it's now an issue and why maybe it wasn't before in the past. I'm going to introduce you to our amazing panelists. I'm so happy that we have these amazing women on the house here to share their knowledge. Yeah. Let me start. I'm going to read because you guys have amazing bios and really like I don't want to miss a thing. <laughs> <laughs> so we start with Dr. Rima Mutwali. She is one of our loyals. She has a panels with us in uh, last year, the previous years. She's amazing. She knows so much. And I all invite you to check what she's doing with the Say Initiative. It's a way to preserve the local dresses on the Gulf region. And, you know, she is open to donations because this is culture and we need to preserve culture. So please, everybody in the house, if you can check, check her Instagram is at the Say Initiative and you can learn more about what she's doing. She also is a published author. And she has over 40 years of experience in art and cultural heritage. Uh, the SEI initiative aims to, promote an under, um, aims to promote an understanding of the evolution of regional culture, building up public awareness and appreciation of this unique heritage, reaching out to like-minded individuals and institutions nationally, regionally, and globally. And she travels all around the world. So I can't, I can't testify this is very true. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining, Dr. Rin. Really, we appreciate it including me. And um, we also have Innocenta Sanchez Ewart. Innocenta me, we met uh, kind of like recently in a cultural trip to Ras al Khaima, actually. And there we instantly click. And when I offer her to be part of this panel, yes, I'm so happy to have her here. She's an anthropologist. She knows a lot about culture and specifically in the UAE. She has been here how many years, my darling? 20, oh, 20, I, I 19, arrived 84. 84. I arrived in 84, yes. yes. Long so 20, yeah, 21 years for me, new national cadres at the Higher College of Technology, and she's a speaker, moderator on education, leadership, cultural awareness, and tolerance and coexistence. We pretty much need a lot of you, <laughs> you know, Santa in the world to make it better. <laughs> we have also super ratingly. I mean, I love this girl. I met her also this, I think it was this summer, right? This previous summer we met. Yes, yeah, was it in November? Yeah, in actually, she, she, is, she has been also part of Fashion Revolution, Morocco, Egypt, but she's Taiwanese. She's also part of, it's a part of the world, a, a, a global citizen. She founded the Oriental Hybrid and she is Taiwanese, as I said, uh, and she's doing marketing and media consulting for, but she has been everywhere, 13 countries, six continents. I mean, it's amazing. She knows a lot about culture and a lot about appropriation and appreciation because she deeply appreciates the culture, specifically here in the Arab world. And that, that really struck me how much she knew about this area over here. I mean, from Taiwan to here, what are the odds, right? But yeah. <laughs> and right now she's bridging the gap between the Chinese and Arabic and Arabic uh, speaking <laughs> communities, you know, so that we have a bridge. Um, Jasmine works alongside with the uh, rating, <clears throat> and she's also an Oriental hybrid on herself. <laughs> Let's put it like that. <laughs> she's uh, working in intercultural communication and strategic foresight. Sorry, my throat is. <laughs> I speak too much. <laughs> I know. Born in Japan, raised in Abu Dhabi, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I also lived in Dubai for five years, but UAE, <laughs> generally. <laughs> Egyptian heritage, and now in Germany. Yeah, for seven years now. <laughs> <clears throat> You work uh, in Abu Dhabi Ministry of Interior, New York University, everywhere. Yeah. Guys, this is our amazing Happy. panel today. We're going to learn so much. And I'm going to start uh, with the definition of what is the difference between cultural inspiration or appreciation. What do you guys think? If I can have your kind of like definition. We have a definition that we found in some books that I share with you. I want to have your insights. What do you guys, how do you, how do you see the difference? 
if if I may if I may start, maybe, and we and um, the, Zay initiative, the Zay initiative works on preserving UAE culture. Um, sorry, Arab and UAE culture, but the idea is has stemmed because of this uh, misunderstanding that can take take place because of people not knowing other cultures. So uh, to go to the point, I think if we look into history, uh, different uh, civilizations has always borrowed from other, the civilizations that came before them or other civilizations that they interacted with. So this um, continuous interchange of cultural ideas, symbols, designs, textiles, uh, architecture, art, and so on has been going around for a long period of time. Good heaven. It only, yeah. it, it only became problematic when I think people started using these symbols or these borrowing these uh, emblems or ideas and not giving credit to those who have started them or created them or presented them at first <clears> hand. <throat> and this is where we this is the major point that we need, I think, to discuss because this is the key to the whole dialogue here because you cannot stop the, the, the wheel of borrowing from others and getting inspired by others and working with others. And at the same time, you cannot not acknowledge the work that came up before you. And you cannot not do this work without appreciating and, and, and uh, honoring those who have come before you or worked with it. And I think this is the important aspect that we need to discuss because that is what differentiates, in my opinion at least, the difference between uh, appropriation and inspiration. You know, Everybody can be inspired, but you can't be appropriating another culture if you don't acknowledge them. And that's what you do when you don't, when you don't acknowledge them. Now, what we do at the Zay Initiative is we try to present these cultures to the best of our knowledge so that these designers, these uh, researchers, those people who are working in this in any level can have the basic information to ground them so that they would be able to work accordingly and help them stop misappropriating uh, appropriating other cultures. I agree with you. It has it has that factor. And historically, it has been happening forever. Um, I think now, yeah, I want to know what Innocenta because he was about to say something. I think that's going to be very interesting. Tell us, tell us. I I go along with what Reem is saying, and there is I can identify this problem with you know students at university when they had to write a piece and acknowledge where they got that information from. Because if they didn't, they will get penalized. But right. here we live in a world of fashion where there is no, uh, no, there is no, I don't know, there is no one to say, you, one, you took it and you use it and you made just to make money. The intention here is very important. What is the intention mm -hmm. of the people is to make money. So this, this, uh, this lack of cultural awareness, which um, I have discovered working with, um, with people in business, that they are not ready, they are not ready to stop and think about uh, how, how mm -hmm. we work in this culture and how society works and what are the values and what, and what is uh, respect and what is not. No. Their main aim is let's make money, but it doesn't work. At the end of the day, it just doesn't work. So yeah. where do you start? How can you convince people to be more cultural aware? And I tell you, I have discovered because I've been working with universities coming from Spain, and it was a delight to see these masters in business, uh, adults who have experience uh, working experience plus a very strong MBA wanted to, to uh, know about the culture. They were hungry to know about and be uh, savvy in cultural awareness. And this was to me, uh, it gave me all the hope 
and it gave me all the enthusiasm to think, okay, we've got sectors in our society that are ready to listen, are ready to, to uh, play the game with the ethical game. I respect you, you respect me. And we have mm -hmm. others that represent hard work in the future. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, great team. Jasmine, I want to have your yeah. thoughts on the matter too. <laughs> Uh, rating, you want to go first or can I go? Okay, yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I, I think um, based on what Dr. Rim and um, Inoseta me, uh, said, I totally agree with them, that I think a very big difference between uh, appropriation and appreciation, simply put, is your intention. So um, <clears throat> let's say between people, I mean, fashion is based on human uh, interactions and how we relate to other cultures, human interactions. So if someone genuinely, genuinely cares about you and wants to learn about your culture and wants to, you know, promote it, I, I call it appreciation. But if someone is just like coming to your culture, take a, a piece of it and make it for PR purpose, someone just being nice to you. Oops. You froze rating. You guys see her? Oh, I think you froze for a minute. I think mm -hmm. so my screen. Um, where was I caught about the second? You were um, caught when they took when like they were taking something from your culture, and I ah. think it was maybe commercial gain involved or something. I'm just guessing. <laughs> nice. If someone is being nice to you for a PR. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think your internet is funky right The elements again. for PR. Yeah, PR, yes. Yeah. Let's see, let's see. Jasmine, your internet is a little bit funny landing. Let's see if we can uh, manage. Can you hear me out. now? Yes, we hear you, Jasmine. So I think um, I agree with what everyone said about the difference. And I'd like to add to what um, in no center mentioned about um, the you know being playing the ethical game because uh, I did my master's in sustainable fashion creative industries in Berlin and it was interesting because I discovered there's a lack of what is, what is, what is a sustainable hello yes what, what makes a sustainable uh, leadership a mindset there are absolutely there's a lack in literature or generally like there isn't any focus on what makes a sustainable leader mindset like what does this look like what does that even mean what is a sustainable mm -hmm. you know and so and what rating mentioned as well and dr reem is like you know when you travel to a place and an empathy empathy there's a lack of empathy as well because automatically mm -hmm. once you have once you have empathy then you are curious it's it's natural to be curious about the other culture and you want to learn as well from the other cu culture like how do you do this why do you wear this why do you have this garment in your head like I'd love to know and respect it as a as an instead of hey i just want to do this and you know like the, the whole lack the lack of appropriation right like not mentioning like where i got this and why like it's like i travel somewhere and i'm like oh this looks pretty and that's it you know i'm just going to use it in my designs opposed to as opposed to like oh you know like and then talk about it and maybe even perhaps create an ecosystem in traveling sorry i'm jumping like you know travel because i don't know like tourism i don't know maybe it's a collaboration if if these uh, designer labels or fashion designers talk about you know where they got their inspiration from and perhaps there is like this collaboration with uh tribes or etc or ethnic groups or you know why they create this so, yeah i don't know like just a thought i, think I agree fine. with you all <laughs> go ahead go ahead Ring. yeah okay so i think it's a fine line on the one hand uh we need to encourage people to be uh, expressive and be creative and to borrow and to think and to be, be inspired. On the other hand, we need to encourage people as well to be vigilant and mindful of other cultures and to do their homework. It is not yeah. as easy as just borrowing. You need to do your yeah. homework. You need yeah. to go back mm -hmm. and you need to study and understand what the cultures and the themes and the symbols that you are influenced by or interested in or inspired by and give them their due respect. This is why what we 
do in our work is we try to put the academic information available there on, an, on a global level so that people can go in, get this information, have a grounded background on about it, and then go out and be inspired. Because sometimes mm -hmm. even inspiration comes uh, within yourself. You don't really know where you were inspired from, but you need to have to be responsible enough to go and make sure that what is what is inspiring you has other grounds to check, to, you know, to do the homework before you start working on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree. It was actually one of the questions that I have for you guys, but I want to show before, I want to share my screen with the audience and show mm -hmm. some cases of cultural appropriation that I think we need to talk about. So that's today's panel. And this is Mark Jacobs, okay? Mark Jacobs said that um, this cultural appropriation, because according to him, he was inspired by this lady, Lana Wachowski. She has all this colorful hair, using dreadlocks. Um, but um, he got really a lot of backlash because, um, yeah, this is, this is a, a sign of the Rastafarian community. They get mostly, uh, you know, rejected from jobs, et cetera, because of that. So for example, this is this is a little bit of information. It's not only Rastafari, it's actually in Egypt also. This is part of many other cultures, including India. So they, they represent, for example, for Rastafarians in Jamaica. I mean, I can't make that connection because I lived in Jamaica six years. And for them, the hair is very important. And it's a cultural, it's relief. There is a lot of things that have to do with being rooted to nature and all that. And the use that uh, Matt Jacobs had on the catwalk, having all these uh, models, Cali Claus, Gigi, Bella Hadid, Kendall, with, uh, with the four uh, dreadlocks, didn't sit very well at all. Um, they, uh, yep, so that's one of them I wanted to show you. Then it's, we also have Gucci. Gucci was actually under the fire for listing in the turban for $790 as an accessory on their website. This was uh, for 2018-19. And all the models that showcased the turbans were actually white models. And it was something antagonizing the Sikh community. Um, the Sikhs uh, commented that uh, their turban is not a hot new accessory for sale, but an article of faith for those who practice Sikhism. And uh, yeah, and they were just selling them as a hat, as a, just a random hat. So, um, and for the Sikhs, was, that was hurtful. And, uh, and because they face violence and mistrust because of wearing the hat, uh, sorry, wearing the turban. Then we have Carolina Herrera. Carolina Herrera in 2020, I guess you see my, you see the screen? Well, they went uh, to Mexico in look, looking for inspiration and they came out with all these dresses. This is the resort 2021. And they basically feature designs inspired by Mexican textiles. But uh, these actually got Carolina Herrera a uh, 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 sue with the government. The government of Mexico sued her because of this, because it was cultural appropriation and they were not happy about it at all. So West Gordon had to end up apologizing and yeah, it was the Ministry of uh, Culture actually raising the shoe. So this will have Dior, this one is Lately. And this is the skirt that Dior has uh, said that as is one of the hallmark Dior silhouettes but it actually is an inspiration to the Mamian skirt or horse face skirt, which was popular during the Ming dynasty. So this is a historical piece in reality, nothing new. The protesters uh, went out on the street dressed in hanfu clothing and demanded to uh, apologize for the design. But Dior is famous for doing that again. Do we have them with some African clothing? Uh, in this case, though, they did it a little bit better. They co-created the pieces with African designers, and at least the, in the garment, there was uh, the name of the designers. Um, you, so. know, uh, you know, I just came back from India. I was in Mumbai because they had a huge exhibition for an opening of a cultural center. <clears throat> 
and mm -hmm. it showcased the textiles of India and how it influenced the world. I think mm -hmm. we have to be very, very, very careful. Uh, there is, there's, where do you draw the line? Look at us now. I have issues with all of these because look at us now. We are all dressed in European clothing. So are we appropriating the European dress? Should I be dressed in an, in an Arab dress and you should be dressed in an Italian one? Where do you draw the line? I think this is, this, it, it really antagonizes me because I think yeah. people are creating an issue out of, um, you know, the outskirts, but the core of the matter, nobody is addressing. And that's why we are here talking about this, because I think this is very important uh, to see how, you know, how, Fashion at the end of the day is a way to express one another. And I think we need to be respectful, as you very well said. For example, uh, Selena Gomez, and I'm gonna finish the presentation and go back to the questions, um, was, uh, I've got a lot of backlash because she was dancing in, I don't know if it was the Grammy or the MTVs, I don't know, I'm really bad with these kind of awards, but she had a bindi and, uh, and that, was, that was an issue for some people. So yeah, just wanted to share with you some of the, cases that have been in the news as cultural appropriation. Well, and, uh, and then- Karl Lagerfeld was also- uh, Yeah, there were so many. I just pick up some, but there were so, so many. Yeah. It, it never ends. And to me, that is very problematic because again, I say, what do you do? Uh, I mean, you cannot be policing everybody. It's not, I don't think it's right. And I think, and I think this is the part where we need to make a, di a distinction also between us as consumers, and uh, and when and the designers, because when people are designing, they are designing. And normally, this is big brands. Check which ones we are talking about. We are talking about Carolina Herrera, Marc Jacobs, Gucci, uh, Dior, Isabel Moran. There's also stuff from her. I think this is important. Like as a consumer. I am happy, I'm proud to wear my abayas. I don't feel I'm culturally appropriating anything because I appreciate this deeply. It's true that I don't wear them on the daily because sometimes I feel people may not look at me with the same eyes, <laughs> but I, I, it's my choice, you know, and I, there's no commercial gain. What I realized when I was doing the research to prepare for this panel, there was always a comment, I think someone may be unmuted, there was always a comment about the amount of money that the, the brands were charging for that particular thing. For example, the Gucci, the Sikh Turban, $790, $790. And same for the skirt, your skirt. So there is a commercial gain that is bothering. And I think that's the issue where we need, it's not only the intention, the designer may have the best of intention, but then the brand, as you know, Senta very well said, the brand is there, it's not an NGO, they want money, and they are going to maybe take that inspiration and, and you know, make out something. I just want to add something to that, because I think uh, what we, I mean, the companies itself, these luxury brands, for example, Carrying and LVMH, actually they recognize that their marketing campaigns has been uh, completely insensitive and disrespecting certain cultures. And that's why actually they created this position. It's only been there for three years now, or it started where they hired, they, they hired a cultural diversity officer and that wasn't there before. <laughs> So they realize that actually intercultural sensitivity is is a very communication is extremely important internally and in their and for them to improve their marketing strategies and even recently um, Balenciaga um, a few months ago was caught up with extremely scandalous campaign with children. Um, it, that was amazing. You know, promoting. Was amazing. I don't know how we all feel about these examples, but it, this problem actually exists. And so, um, and so uh, as well, and I wonder in this, you know, all these uh, brands as well, they talk about sustainability and we are sustainable, et cetera, but what is happening in the core, in the sustainable, I mean, what is happening in the company itself? How are they transforming their mindset towards a sustainable mindset? And that's not being worked on, you know, mm -hmm. and probably we will probably see more of these insensitive things. I mean, okay, maybe that's a step forward to hire a, you know, like a culture diversity officer, but is this enough? Like, and, and it's, I find it 
so I'm so perplexed because the fashion industry is complex and they deal with so many different stakeholders from all cultures around the world and different um, stakeholders and still intercultural communication is not <laughs> is really lacking. It and is. Like, it yeah. is very complex, as you very well said. It is very complex. And I want to ask you something because like you mentioned about this position that they are actually having uh, someone taking care. Make sure you check and cross check and that there is going to be everything proper and it's going to be understood for whatever angles, right? Because they have a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of, at the stake. But there is, um, there is uh, how today you see we have Pinterest, we have social media. As Reed mentioned, there is so much around us. It's very difficult to know where it's coming from because when you are pinning something on Pinterest, maybe it doesn't say where is it coming from. Maybe you are inspired by that and you do something about that and this and that. I know many designers use Pinterest and most of the pins do not have a credit. How do you actually then later, you know, can't work that out? How do you, because if we are talking about the Gucci's and the Dior's, I'm pretty sure they will have a way probably to find it or personnel staff to, to do it. But for small brands, how do we do it? You know, there's got to be there's got to be more dialogue. There's got to be um, more awareness because, for example, uh, you've just mentioned Yasmin. Uh, this situation does not work for sustainability. That is for sure. Um, yeah, I think so. For example, the the Sikh uh, turban. Um, if if uh, what was it Gucci and. Mm -hmm and six get together and they say, okay, what does that mean to you? Okay, and the six are going to explain what it means to them. And then the six are going to ask Gucci, what does this mean to you? And it will be very obvious that Gucci is trying to make money, but the, the, the guy that, that for him has a religious, strong, deep symbol, uh, the, the, the turban, uh, it's very offensive. He feels very bad. He feels very uncomfortable. It's got to be these conversations somehow. But in order for this to happen, you need more awareness from yes. all sides. Because as uh, Dr. Rim has just said, you know, these days uh, the world is so open and we all borrow from each other because yes. we feel inspired and we like it. And also sometimes, Let's put an example of the Emirati culture. When I started my fieldwork, one of the first conditions that they asked me to join them in the village, in the desert, in their family life, is that I had to look like them. So I had to wear a kandura, a serwal, and a shella, a loose shella, which was not a problem for me. Now, very interesting, they didn't ask me to wear a burqa because that was a deeper identity of an Emirati, of an Arab. They didn't ask me that. They asked mm -hmm. me just enough to be part of the environment. And they feel very proud. Until today, when I go to the village, I always wear their clothes. And they value this, they appreciate it. And they feel proud and they love it. They yeah. love it. So, and they look amazing on you. <laughs> I think everybody looks amazing when they come in the work. And it's true. It's so I need to do a little, a little, a little commenting here because I know Dr. Rim has to leave at six fifteen. Yeah. So if anybody in the room has a question for Dr. Rim, please type it now so that we can read it before she leaves. And on the meantime, I'm gonna ask you more things because fashion, I think can be a very powerful tool to preserve traditional techniques. And this one, that's why, Rim, I want to do this question specifically for you because you are an expert on this. All these traditional techniques, all this traditional way of weaving, creating the garments, all this is lost to, globaliz to globalization, basically. How can fashion bring it back, support the artisans? And maybe, I don't know if it's too late, bring back this, this you know, these traditions. No. It's never too late. It's never too late. We are always uh, human. Humans are wonderful at adapting and humans are always trying to learn more and discover new things and new ways. So there will always be this circle of uh, 
change and, and movement as we go along in all our aspects of life. But I think what's happening, this uh, issue of cultural appropriation has pushed people, individuals, designers, brands, and so on and so forth, to go and look, and as I said, do their homework. Uh, I'll give you an example. Dior just did their first show in uh, India, which is their mm -hmm. 23 uh, uh, collection is purely Indian inspired. And yeah. they showed on their show social media and on their campaigns, meetings and, and interviews, and they've highlighted the different forms of techniques that were used in their clothing, in making their clothing, by the Indian people, through the Indian people's eyes. They showed that. So the, the, the brands are taking notice and right. are trying to work on this. So there right. is, results are happening. They might right. take time, but they mm -hmm. are happening, you know? And as long as they are acknowledging this, and as long as the next step would be supporting these artisans, supporting those crafters, another step would be archiving it. As I said, again, as they initiative, mm -hmm. We are doing that. We are archiving all of this. We are collecting the articles. Right. We are talking to the people who make them. We talk to the crafters. We put the narratives of people that have worn these articles of clothing and that have worked with it or embroidered it or created it. And we put it all together into a package and it is available on the internet on a global level so that people can look into it and, and learn from it. So for people who are seeking knowledge, it is happening. People are creating those, those platforms are being formed. Mm -hmm. And I encourage people to come in and to explore and to use it and to support it. And I am sure these, these um, brands, the way they now are employing uh, individuals as, um, what was yeah. the term? Uh, what was the name that mean, the position? University uh, officers, I think they will soon start supporting and I encourage them to support platforms such as ours, which are basically very dry because we do all the stuff that people don't want to do, the research, the hard work, the back end work that people don't see. Uh, and, and we document and we archive and, and these are very dry subjects. But for those who are interested in understanding truth and knowledge, they will seek these platforms and they will learn from them and they will quote them and use them as long as, uh, as uh, uh, Innocenta said, when you are working at a university, you have to reference your resources, your sources, your the information, where did you get them? So this is how you can reference all of that. And by supporting pl platforms and individuals like this, I think the wheel can move on and we will get somewhere. But I'm pleased that this is happening because when this happens, it forces people to go and to be more educated, to learn, to seek knowledge and to understand and it makes them accountable and, be, and more responsible to the acts that they are doing. This is, great, this is great news really. And perhaps um, fashion revolution needs to praise that and needs to make yes. a big thing about it, yeah? Is that's why we're talking about this so that we can actually speak about this learn and then also you know like uh, put it in the right perspective of things it's not um, for example what Dr. Ring was saying about oh me should I be wearing western clothes or not or I think I think for consumers it's important to know that whatever you choose is fine and you know just try to be Blending with the culture and try to understand why things happen and be curious and ask questions and find but, out. But also mm -hmm. as a consumer, you, you have a very strong influence because you decide yeah. so, on what you want to buy. You decide yeah. what is it that you're going to support and what is it that you're not. What happened, an example, the example that um, was just given about Balenciaga and what happened with that. I mean, that's an excellent example. Uh, consumers yeah react and can make a difference yeah. Uh, yeah. but in order for them to react and to make a difference it is very important to choose your battles to choose what is it that you're going to make a, a point about and and how you want to use it and to do that you need to have the knowledge therefore you need to do your homework and you need to learn yeah. and understand what is going on so it is all connected yeah Yes. I think I think yeah okay I just think yeah very interesting and I really respect your work with you know like uh, documenting all this I'm just I think find it interesting about like the clothing about the European or not 
I just find an issue with making money out of, you know, with these uh, brands that make money without appropriating and selling it. Like as opposed to I'm wearing something, I'm, I'm a consumer. I made the conscious decision. I bought this. I'm wearing this, for example, it's Persian, it's block paint, handmade, and I wear it with pride and I'm, I love it. And it's so, et cetera. But it's different than me trying to make money out of, you know, just sell it. And for example, I sell it and not like give credit to the people. I, who I totally it. agree with you. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, of course. I think that's I it. it, it and that's why there's a fine line, like you said, exactly. It's such a fine line and we don't know where to draw it because we can talk about it. And then it's like, but where do you draw the line as an artist or a creative or et cetera? So absolutely, yeah. And that's why I wanted this topic because I think yeah. that, that line, some people may have it here, some people might have it here. Yeah, yeah some it's, it's like, like a, here, yeah. And right? some people may use it and, some, and many people are using it in order to get fame and to get noticed. Yeah for their own advantage. And this exactly. is where lines blur because yes. you lose you lose the, 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 the core of the subject matter. And yeah. this is what's happening on, on, on the social media and, and uh, on the internet because you have people trying to carve a niche for themselves. So they start arguing about certain points that are really not worth arguing about when the core of the subject is not being dealt with. Exactly. Yeah. Think, this is interesting. It was one of the questions, and I think, Rating, you can help me on this yes. one. There is a little bit of politics behind this when some things are so irritating for some reason, and some other things seem to be unnoticed, and they are even more flagrant, right? There may be some policy or some or some people that have an influence that maybe lobby towards one area or another. What do you guys think? I think it's it's okay that if you are taking elements for your own benefit um, or to be noticed, uh, all of us would do that. But to really give credit, as Dr. Reem says, that social media is so uh, influential. So when you use, when you wear certain clothing, for example, I'm wearing the Emirati Jalabiya, or when I'm wearing the, the Saudi um, Abaya and... and um, on the Taipei Fashion Week runway, um, everyone noticed because it's a fashion uh, event. Everyone pay attention. Even after that, I, I, I normally I don't sell, sell Abaya, but after that, like five or six of fashion editors in Taiwan come to me and they ask like, can you order Abaya for me? I want to wear it. So actually it's a very good uh, situation to promote it, but to really give credit to those um, elements, it's it's a, the responsibility for professionals or self media professional to do this, um, to inform themselves. So, for example, one of the the services or tasks that we do in the order hybrid is that a lot of journalists, before they write articles, they come to me to ask, um, you know, review the articles to find out little things that is not correct, and after that they can publish. So right. I think this is something that a lot of brands. Like small brands, they cannot hire a full-time position diversity manager for this, but they can go through small agency or even like for the Zay Initiative, which curates very amazing exhibition. And I even I, when I went to Dubai, I watched the um, exhibition of Zay Initiative in um, in Mall of Emirates of the Emirati yeah. dresses. And for I would recommend like you know even for myself um, working in this field, I read books of about the oriental, the oriental fashion or like the 3000 Arab uh, history, for example, like that. I think it's important that everyone, even if they use the elements for their own benefits, they need to understand and they, they need to credit on social media. A lot of people don't have the habit of adding credits. And I think as consumers, when we see that we can comment on the brand's uh, account to ask them to credit whatever it comes from. I think it's very important, not just for cultural elements, but also, you know, for photographers, designers, and so on, that this is something that each one of us can do. And I have uh, to stop you because I know Dr. Rim needs to go, but I have a quick question from you. Uh, Alina actually says, question to Dr. Rim, as she's son is stepping out. Dr. Rim, your insights are amazing and comments are spot on. You've been mentioning the core problem. For my clarification, could you please explain what the core problem is from your perspective? 
The core problem is uh, acknowledgement. It is acknowledgement, basically, of others and respect to other cultures. Once you acknowledge that and once you understand other cultures and may be mindful of them, it is very important. It elevates or de de takes away the appropriation and uh, in creates an inspiration. Once we do that, and to do that, we need to know our subject matter. We need to do our homework, as I said. Uh, it is very important to do that. To make money out of other cultures, uh, I think this is where it is tricky. Appropriation becomes an issue when you are taking symbols and, and, and ideas and, and, and uh, designs from others to, make, to benefit from them commercially without giving them due credit, without acknowledging them. A, first of all, you need to uh, respect other cultures. So you need to be mindful that whatever you are creating is not going to uh, uh, disrespect the culture that you're borrowing from in one way or the other. And mistakes can happen. And you should uh, own up to it and say, I made a mistake and correct it. This can happen and we need to move on. Uh, the other thing is that you need to... Um, Try and give back, if possible, uh, through um, supporting uh, NGOs and uh, other organizations that work with crafts and so on and forth, so forth. If you can, if you are, uh, if you can afford it, another way is to be able to uh, um, help in advancing these these crafts and sustaining them for future generations. Uh, looking at uh, uh, institutions that protect this and help with this, such as the Zay Initiative, and helping them and, and supporting them and using them. As, uh, as was mentioned just now, we do get a lot of calls and, and e emails and people come and inquire from us directly, whether it be it journalists, uh, researchers, designers, uh, PhD and uh, master's thesis people, and so on and so forth. They come and they ask, and I... Uh, that shows that these people care. They want to make an informed decision. They want to be uh, involved in what they are designing and creating. They are responsible. The key word is being responsible about any yes. act you're going to take. Thank you so much. For Thank you so much, Dr. Reem. It was fantastic to have you. And you need to go now. These ladies. <laughs> uh, and I encourage you all please, to sign up to our newsletter so you'll get to yes. know more about our blogs and our videos and so on and so forth. And Thank all their events. So make sure you sign up and follow them on Instagram at the Day Initiative. Bye -bye. Thank you so much. <clears throat> there you go. So now as the four of us, we continue the conversation. And I want to know, and this I think is, is an interesting thing also because we are talking about, for example, we saw, you see, like, for example, the different cases and stuff. I, I Maybe the designers or the brands may get a little bit too scared or not ready to actually understand or control, or they don't feel they can control the conversation anymore, and they stop being as creative. What do you think is something that maybe, maybe the fact that they can get so backslash, so much backslash, unless they're handled properly? Like what Rating was saying before, this is a PR thing or is it actually a real thing, you know? Um, I think this is very important because at the end of the day, for designers to be able to come up with amazing ideas, they feed from everything. And if they feel like maybe I'm going to be punished if I am feeding from everything and I'm not properly educated about it and it's so difficult to know about everything. And I don't know, maybe if this, I can go ahead. What do you guys think? Can maybe dry up a little bit the creativity or they may go for safe designs because they are scared? It's a, a, a very like fixed answer for this regarding because creativity comes from all forms and all directions. But I think I saw Rania um, from Fashion Revolution Egypt mention of the context that you are using is very important thing that designers should keep in mind. If you are using other people's culture, put it in a positive way. Um, let's say the Chinese wear the qi pao, zhongshan dress, or like abaya. You don't put this nightclub or somewhere, but more in, if it's a, it's a positive way, then it's okay. But some people make it like a porn dress or also uh, what is 
I don't know if this is a trend or not, but on Asian social media, I've seen many girls want to dress the Arab men's wear for their birthday parties. And this is something that I completely don't even understand. So mm -hmm. I think like if you put it in a good design, everyone aesthetics and like beauty, it's good. But if you put it in a debatable situation, then you should be Pre, uh, be prepared that you are backslashed because it's it's yeah it's just uh, controversial true oh. so but what about the creativity of the designers themselves what do you guys think would it would it maybe restrict or they may feel restricted maybe because they don't know exactly where their inspiration is coming from for example pinterest case or social media some boards that are around there that are about, or you know, even the the WGSN boards that they send when you are subscribed, and they have pretty pictures that are supposed to be mood boards. But where are they coming from? Normally, they don't have a link. How do we actually? It's an interesting you know? question because I actually think fashion designers. With I mean, we need to talk about the technology that's available and. A fashion designer's role is completely going to change. It's not going to be this, you know, it's not going to be a designer sitting here, I know, getting inspired, et cetera, but there's going to be like with the emergent technologies, it's going to do half of the job. And, you know, and maybe even if we look even further future, probably the consumers, I mean, pro, I mean, the consumer will become will be a designer. To, to design our own <laughs> garments, probably. So perhaps. So perhaps maybe a, a question would be like, how do we reshift? How do we think of the, you know, because we've been learning, you know, the, the patterns and et cetera, the cutting patterns and the shape and how do we, how are we going to work around that? It's going to create, it's going to be creative in a different, in a different shape. It's going to take a different shape and form. That's interesting. Yeah, well, let's see. That's uh, the, about the future and AI and how maybe taking over everybody's job. <laughs> let's see. Let's no, see about I, don't, that. I don't think it's going to take over anyone's job. I think it's just, I think it's cool because it's just going to take a different shape and form. And it's not far future. It's actually happening now. There are tech companies in Berlin that where you can actually, uh, as a consumer, uh, create your own uh, a garment or suit etc and they send it to you so it's not it's not a far future it's been happening now like five years ago it's interesting like where where um for example um there is a platform in japan that experimented with with that uh technology where they sent you um uh, they sent you a garment and you wear it and it takes the measurements of your body and then boom there you go you you, you literally order the things according to your body i don't remember the name of the platform i'm sorry but They've experimented with that. And that was five years ago. Oh, wow. Jasmine, you need to put the links of these things in the yes, chat. For yes. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it's happening. It's not, it's not, you know, it's not, that future is not that far. No. So then it's going to be even more difficult to control about cultural appropriation. Sorry, maybe that's a different thing, but yeah. It's going to be even more difficult. You know, but maybe, maybe, you know, to get the message across, not just to big fashion firms, but also, <laughs> as you were just mentioning, people who make creativity so easily, that creativity should not be a carte blanche to do whatever, mm -hmm. whatever. that that would not be acceptable. And then to praise a lot, the people who are following the ethical ways and respecting everybody. Praise them, praise them. Not because they do it wrong or bad or how they do it, but the effort. Praise the effort. You know, you tell a child, you tell a child, yeah. uh, you will get a prize because you, you did, you got a, a nine out of 10. It doesn't work as well as if you say, I praise and I'm happy with your effort because that child is going to continue. It's more sustainable. It's going to do it better and better all the time. So play mm. a little bit on the psychology. <clears throat> and for institutions or for movements like um, Fashion Revolution, praise the effort, praise the effort. 
because now you the voices here are many they are saying let's be responsible and let's respect people yeah we're all saying the same thing yeah. and that will we're multiply that will multiply you know you know the experiments of the macaco uh, monkeys in Japan in the 50s, they were experimenting the behavior of monkeys and they gave them some potatoes and the potatoes in, in an island, the potatoes fell on the sand and the macaco uh, monkeys didn't like to eat the potato with sand. So one of them washed it and then the others started to wash it. <laughs> and then they had a hundred monkeys washing the potato. But the mystery thing, <clears throat> some people want to deny it, but I think you're going to recognize how these things happen. That in another island far away, the monkeys started to do the same thing and nobody had taught them and nobody had, you know, showed them how to do it. And this is how we are. Have you been in a situation where you think about something and you think you want to do about something and then you hear, somebody's already doing it and you didn't speak to anyone you didn't write about it you didn't speak about it so the more people that are there being responsible and vigilant and and honest and respecting this will multiply but praise the effort of the ones that yeah. are doing so are for doing example for example this case of the are in india that it was mentioned here by Dr. Lim and also by, was it by Bhavna? Oh, sorry, Bhavna, I missed your question, your question here. Um, another dear example, a positive one is of knowledge uh, and credit where it's due with the recent runway show in India. And there is a link in there if you guys want to watch it. This is good because the ones that I put you as examples were from previous years. So. They kind of like learn the lesson. And I'm pretty sure now, as very well said about the macaco monkeys, maybe now we have all the brands actually paying attention, getting their officers in place, being more mindful, trying to research more where things are coming from. And maybe actually it's something that can be a way to share knowledge and wisdom, traditional techniques, a fantastic different ways to work together um, and actually raise and put the spotlight in, in, in different cultures that are very far from where we are. And I think that can be a fantastic tool if it's used wisely, if it's used with good intention, taking into account who is actually uh, the originator or the, the, you know, the, the, the first ones that are doing this, the original culture that is coming from and giving credit. And I think that's, I think for me at least, I've learned so much with all of you. And I think that's kind of like the conclusion. And we're gonna read the questions and the comments of the of the audience so that we can see. We have woo -woo -woo. Da -da -da -da. so for example, sorry, I'm going down. I went all the way up. So we have Babna sharing about the uh, book, uh, Rania. Uh, Rania also mentions from, from Egypt, they had also a relatively good runway show in Egypt recently. They did a good job blending in with the surrounding environment by the pyramids of Giza and benefiting the local community and crafts as far as I hear. That is great news. Uh, we had another question for Dr. Rim, but maybe you guys want to go ahead and try. It's from Babna too. She says, how do you envision the role of governments in reviving traditional craftsmanship in fashion or otherwise? Can we expect this from the UAE? The Sika festival seems to be a promising start, but can we see something along the lines of made in India here? What do you guys think? The made in UAE, this, we don't have as, um, India has a very strong, it's a very strong producing country. They produce fabrics, they produce fibers, they produce garments. In the UAE, we don't produce uh, that there is, much. There is actually a fashion brand. It's, I saw everybody's wearing that fashion brand made in UAE, the Giving Movement. The Giving Movement, Every single yes. person is wearing the Giving Movement in the UAE when I was there just a month ago. Yeah, <laughs> so that's and that is made in the UAE. That's made in the UAE. But I guess in here, what she wants to say is really more like reviving traditional craftsmanship. Traditional, yes. And uh, yeah, active wear kind of like a thing yeah there is there is an, an NGO in uh, it's based in Abu Dhabi 
um, it's they use a traditional uh, craftsmanship, and I've seen their products actually used in uh, with the royal family. I see it online that they uh, design um, couches or etc. Um, just give me two minutes until I get you the name, or maybe yeah. I'll send you the link later. But yeah, but it's not not out. It's not you know like everywhere. Like it's really yeah. In, when you when when Expo was happening um, around the the area where the uh, where the waterfall was, with this fantastic fountain was, they were all a small, not gonna say as I don't know like associations maybe, and and they were government funded and they had like ladies maybe that they were doing some pottery, some other people were doing jewelry very small Emirati associations that were trying to preserve things, mostly by um, supporting women. Yeah, go ahead, Jasmine. It's called Al-Ghadir, Al-Ghadir UAE Craft. Okay, so there we have. So we're finding here and the different things that maybe can go with this question. More questions, we have Alina. Uh, thanks so much, ladies, Araceli, Dr. Rim, Innocencia, Jasmine, rating for an extremely insightful discussion. Then the question that uh, she did was for Dr. Rim, but we asked already. Um, what is, uh, is this a, I know that Jasmine call it the lack of a sustainable mindset. I'd appreciate to learn what you precisely mean by, the, by that, yes. Yes, um, and I would like to add on what Innocenta mentioned, because when you said it's a, a psychologist, you mentioned the psychology part. And I think when I did my research, because I was really curious about, you know, sustain, you know, the whole greenwashing, sustainability, everyone's talking about it. And honestly, I, although I was doing my master's in it and I was tired of that word at the end, I was like, you know what? I don't want to hear the sustainability anymore. So I wanted to know, I wanted to know what's happening in the corporate culture, what's happening, the DNA of the company and brands, whether small and big, for them to be able to transform and transition into the sustainability or ethical production they're talking about. I was really curious. So of course, who would influence that? The product, of course, it's leadership and decision makers. So I was like, you know what? I want to know what is what is a sustainable mindset? What is that even mean in leadership and what's happening? And I was so surprised to find out that there was that is such a blind spot because there's, there's there's a lack of research and literature about that topic. I found a couple, I found maybe even one and I can share it. Like for example, okay, there's a, there's a book in digital transform in digital business leadership. They talk about five competencies and that's the thing. There is no talking about competencies. For example, when I looked at the circle, uh, circular, oh, sorry, in UNESCO, Okay, and there are competencies, but again, not leadership. And it's just all vague and not really on point. What is a competency? And when we hire, actually, when we hire people, we have to focus on their competencies, just not just skills, right? And talents, like we need to see like what these competencies are. And so, and that's what I mean, because what does that even mean? How 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 are we sitting here talking about sustainability? Not us, like generally, everyone's saying we are sustainable. Look at our marketing, but it's not even defined. And how do these leadership suddenly change their mindset? Oh, okay, now I want to do a circular uh, circular designs. Now I want to do this, and even with fashion, for example, okay, fashion designers. Most of these brands are uh, who are in the leadership. It's fashion designers, I would assume, probably probably. Right. And then so in the curriculum itself, it's not even fed like, OK, what do you do? Like with the, you know, how do you lead your team? How do you create sustainable, et cetera? Like all the, it's not even in the curriculum itself. So how is it now? This started a few years ago, because when I did my studies, it was just the beginning. And now, you know, a few years later, everybody's sustainable. Like for me, it's it's <laughs> I don't. I cannot, like, I don't and believe this, you and know, and, also, and, this is also the and ethical and uh, whatever. <laughs> like, and this is the issue because it is such intense greenwashing. You don't know what is true and what is not as a consumer. It confuses people. And then the people that are really trying and doing the effort may not be actually, uh, you know, seen. They, they're like, oh, how can, how can they compare us with these people that are not doing absolutely anything and they're only doing it for the marketing purposes of the PR. So I think it's important. You very well said, like, we really need to maybe define sustainability is a difficult thing to define because it can have so many angles. 
is uh, like, uh, you know, like we really need to work together because that many angles is cool because thank God it's a big problem and has many different angles and maybe we can sort it out. But at the same time, I think it confuses people that are learning what it is and what it's not. And they come some big brand and say like, oh, we are so sustainable. And we tend to trust the brands that we have been seeing around for years. So they say that and we don't question. We don't ask the questions that we should maybe ask. In the, okay, so how? Tell me. <laughs> Yesterday you were not. How come that today you are sustainable? What did change? As everybody was saying, the mindset, the process, the products, your production, how, you know, you, if you are putting something out there. So I think that's important that we as consumers ask the questions. Jasmine, it's super important that you keep on studying about this because we want to learn more. Because if there is a seed that we can plant on leaders to be more mindful about this and that eventually drops down to all the change of, uh, you know, all the change of employees and all the change of influence, that would be amazing. So keep on studying on the mindset because I think it really can be very interesting. But I think we all have a, a role to play in this. So let's keep on pushing. I think Angela, you, you mentioned a very good point about working that we have to work together. And I think yeah. in the, all the people working in the system, most sustainable uh, scene, uh, the, the good ones, I would say, have this mindset of uh, collaboration. So even though they don't know what to do, they collaborate with the right NGO, with the right people that can lead them on the right path. And I think it's something that we should encourage in, the, in, in this um, industry to collaborate, even though you cannot do it properly, collaborate with someone that can do it well for you. And this is yeah, and I think we also need to be um, appreciative, as we said, of the efforts. Yes, sustainability is a journey. It doesn't happen overnight. So I don't trust when someone says, oh, we suddenly are super sustainable. I say, like, wait a minute. It takes so long to change. You know, if you have things in place, you have to stop, do, undo, you know. So it's a process. It's a journey. And I encourage everyone to embrace the journey. And we need to be patient with them and appreciate their efforts. But please don't say you are 100% sustainable. You are not. That's, that's, that's the end of it, you know, because nobody is 100% sustainable. We are always having an impact whether we like it or not. So we have more questions here, more, um, well, more questions, no, more comments. So um, Gania mentioned about being mindful about the context that you're using the symbols or the elements. For example, in case that it has any spiritual or religious, this is, I think, very key in this case. And then Alina mentions, Jasmine, I work for the Green Bank and she <laughs> in Luxembourg. You don't want to know how the underground parking looks. <laughs> Speaking on sustainability, everybody had a car, basically, and more. <laughs> um, yes, Babna has another question. Please unmute yourself. And that way we get to also. Hi, uh, thank you so much. It's been such an inspiring conversation on inspiration and appropriation. Um, I wanted to, my question kind of takes a step back. So we've spoken about appreciation and appropriation um, within the fashion ecosystem as it exists, but I just wanted to know your thoughts or insights on commodification of culture and religion in the first place. Um, and this is related to something that um, Rania actually raised as a point, um, the commodification of religious and spiritual symbols. I think that's been done horribly. Um, like the worst example I've seen is of Sheen. I think it was in 2021 where they uh, got received severe backlash for selling uh, a swastika pendant necklace in their U.S. stores. And this sparked a huge debate online between obviously the Jewish community, but also the Hindu community, because for us in Hinduism, it's a positive symbol. So we do wear it. Uh, but when you're selling it in the US, again, goes back to context, you don't sell it in the US, which has the second largest Jewish population. Which, so just when we talk about commodification of religious symbols, I was wondering if you had any insights or thoughts on how we can better approach it or if there is a better approach at all. Very good question, Babna. Very good question. Again, this is, I think this is. Yeah. Uh, I will add to this. Um, let's say using the the Islamic uh, symbols or clothing uh, in Asia, is I think this comes back to 
the responsibility of the communication manager, the one writing all the text, because you can be selling something. You can also be um, marketing something, but the communication on the website, you have to be super clear about what's the purpose of this thing. And so people can be informed of it. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it still would be offensive if you're sending that you see the spastica in the US or or you know, I think but I think it's that never would be impo very it's impossible I, 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 to control. Uh, I know it. <laughs> I know and it wouldn't and it doesn't surprise us because it's Shane at the end of the day. <laughs> Let's face it. <laughs> but if it would be a, some other brand like what we have seen with Gucci and stuff, they would be already out you know i think i think i think we need also to, to to you know like to be mindful the markets are different you shouldn't be you should be mindful not only what you create maybe it's not for every market i i agree with with Batna. um i think with the religious symbols i think it just shows again the lack of inter intercultural communication and sensitivity towards others um because if that exists and that's implemented in companies and, and conversations like cross like everybody's talking to each other with empathy in mind then i could i cannot imagine that this will go out to the world uh, like you know there's a great book um the culture map by aaron meyer and it's it's really it's all about communication intercultural communication within the business context uh and yeah so you know like it's really cool because the author talks about like her own personal experiences with different cultures when she went to japan when she went to canada and how you know all these little things and it's very very interesting and the way it's written is very cool so i feel like there should be more workshops and more people from different even uh in the hierarchy in the company should all talk together and be in workshops mm -hmm. together in the same in, and be in the same room and have a conversation not just different background not just different cultures but also different hierarchy levels because then yeah. you know you would have a different conversation also the stakeholders and have these hackathons and thinkathons and really open for us to have an open mind and think a lot about the products we're producing with these religious symbols whether it's okay or not or etc and Jerica has another comment talking about the judaism community and I she think is... Inocenta wanted to add something sorry she yeah was... but it's related to this it's related to the question before um, talking about the Judaism community and Shein, how respectful is this work to the culture? Would people from that group object to the piece of art or to it being sold to outsiders? To being out, yeah. So again, we are again talking about the spastica. What do you think, Inocenta? No, about any any religious symbol uh, that people are questioning. Again, it goes back to people being responsible and becoming aware of what is offensive to whom. I mean, in anthropology, we study that one color, the white mm -hmm. color means different things for different people, or the red color means different things for different people. So mm -hmm. nobody's right, nobody's wrong, but just be aware that I'm not going to use uh, a color or a symbol that is offensive to you. So, if, if we have in mind this uh, sense of responsibility and, and respect, uh, this is the only way because you're not going to change the meaning, the symbolism, the meaning of these symbols. You're not going to change it in a hurry. Yeah. These things yeah. happen with time. So the only solution is become aware of what I can say or what I can use and when and respect uh, everybody. Yeah, and when and where, so and when. that is, is is taken in the right context. Uh, I mean, Jean has different stores for different parts of the world, so I'm pretty sure they can be mindful about that and just remove the ones where they actually is not going to sit well. Exactly. Same as when you are doing a market research and you say, okay, I'm not going to be selling too much, uh, too too many, uh, I don't know, bikinis in Greenland. Okay, yeah. You probably will sell more, uh, you know, pullovers and sweaters and you name it. It's the same thing, you know, be mindful with the culture and with the market, what's going to work and whatnot. But uh, yeah, 
guys, I, we need to wrap up. It has been an amazing, super interesting panel. I learned so much. I enjoyed so much our conversation. It was fantastic. I thank you all for being here, for uh, explaining your different points of view really so much. And guys or the audience, really thank you so much for your questions, for being here with us this uh, hour and a little bit more, almost an hour and a half. Really enjoy it. Tomorrow, I want to invite you all to our next panel. It's going to be actually um, lead by Arnel uh, Momayer, our super marketing manager. And it's going to be about caring for your clothes. And we're going to have amazing speakers too, helping us understand how to take care for, from how to take care of our clothes, how to organize them, how to clean, them, how to everything so that they last long and we get to enjoy them many, many years. Uh, so please stay tuned. Uh, you know where to find us. Uh, Armel actually just posted the, the, the whole list of events that we have coming on this week. And also, if you are in the UAE, join us on the 29th because we have an in-person event at the Media One Hotel. It's going to be awesome. From 11 o'clock, we're going to be in the 42 floor. The hotel is amazing. They has basically they, let, they, they give us the whole 42 floor. We're going to have sustainable soup. We're going to have workshops. We're going to have climate fresh. We're going to have a styling session, we're going to have a decluttering session, we're going to have, uh, of course, the student competition cut what the grand finale of the Fashion Revolution UAE. I mean, it's going to be awesome, 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 awesome. So I invite you all to come. And then on Friday, do not miss, because I want all your brains to help us put together the road all to COP28. Basically, we're going to be doing an online brainstorming. It's going to be super interesting. And we're going to create, work through the different SDGs, and we're going to be finding the concerns of the problems, the solutions, and what we want to bring our governments or our representatives, what we want them to raise at COP28. So please join us. This one, you need to take it from the computer. Alina, I know you're taking things from the phone, but I want you on that one. Definitely, you are the economic person, and we need economics in the house too. So it joined with the computer because we're going to be using a tool called whiteboard and from the phones i don't think it will work but it's going to be an amazing amazing super interesting and the idea you know in uae we're going to be hosting cop 28 and we want to be able to deliver this to the people that are putting it together and create our impact as civil society we have a lot to say and uh, that's what we want to do so i invite you all check the agenda that uh, arnel has left in there and please make sure to join. So you have for tomorrow, for Friday, for Saturday. Alas, don't do any more plans. You got you already covered. <laughs> <laughs> what time is on Friday, uh, Araceli? <clears throat> on Friday, it's every during the week, it's always at the same time, 5.30. 5.30. Yes, 5.30. We will be working with different facilitators, going through different SDGs. It's going to be really amazing. You are all invited, and I think... This is fantastic. You know, it's like a brain dump and we're going to be working together to, you know, like to change the world. Let's do it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. I'll see you tomorrow. Share with your friends. Follow us on Instagram and yari yari. You guys know already all the drill. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting us, Araceli. Thank you. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Take care. Lovely meeting. Thank you, Araceli. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. <clears throat> Goodbye. Bye bye. So I guess now we're gonna check if everything was properly recorded. I thank you so much, guys. It was amazing. I learned so much. I loved it. <laughs>